Usually when we think of holy Moses on the mountain, the mountain is Mount Sinai, and Moses is there as the sole representative of his people, the children of Israel, to receive the law from God, while down below at the base of the mountain, his fellow Israelites are behaving like, well, children, when a teacher has gone out of the room, running riots in pagan celebration around the golden calf, as if trying to see how many of the Ten Commandments they can break in advance. But in our Old Testament reading this morning, it's a different mountain that Moses is on at a very different moment in his career. Much of the same symbolism is still in play, not just what we find throughout the Bible, the symbolism of a mountain being closer to heaven, and hence a place where it is more likely or more fitting to encounter God, but also the accompanying symbolism of a mountain being removed from earth, from all the other people and their mundane pursuits, from all the responsibilities and distractions of this world. Moses is exalted to a place where the air is thinner, to a place where he can look down on the earth and glimpse lands far away. And he is heroically alone. He is lonely, except that God is talking to him. He is occupying a place between earth and heaven, not because he is some demigod, but because he is a man lifted up by God and given a great task, a great destiny, to be a mediator between God and man a prophet greater than all the others in the Old Testament, one whom the Lord knew face to face. Our Old Testament reading tells us that he is 120 years old, but that his eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. We have in our congregation a few members who are 90 years old or a bit more. You don't see them very often. That's pretty good, 90 years old. It's better than I anticipate for myself. But Moses has a few decades on them. And you can't say about any of them that their eye is undimmed or their vigor unabated. This is impressive. Maybe you're remembering the earlier parts of the book of Genesis now and wondering, is this still part of the time when men lived much longer on the earth so that this feat of youthful aging would not have been so strange in Moses' day? But that wasn't the case. Expected lifespans at that time were more or less what we would expect too, only probably less because of the absence of modern medicine. When Israel doubted God's promises and held back from entering the promised land for fear of its inhabitants, God responded by saying that none of those who had made that decision would be permitted to go into the land. And the delay that was necessary for that group of people to die was only 40 years. Moses was a grand old man, supernaturally well preserved. He was the only surviving member of his generation. And not only that, nobody in the two generations before him was still living. And not that many in the generation after that. He was the father of his country in more ways than one. Only a few Israelites could remember a time before he had been leading them. There were probably some who wondered if he would ever die. He was a legend. But that's why he's on the mountain again. The purpose, the reason God has brought him to the top of Mount Nebo is to show him all the land. Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, and so on. All these names that would be familiar to many generations of Israelites to come. They would read those names and they would think of home. But Moses, seeing this panorama, is before all that. These places don't have those names yet. There is no Dan, there is no Ephraim or Judah, because the tribes have not yet taken possession of the land so as to give them those names. Israel is still in the wilderness. The land has been promised, but not yet given. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. Moses had had his assignment extended 40 years beyond the point that he thought it might end. 
and God had given him the strength to go the distance. But now it was finally over. It was time for him to die. That's why he's on this mountain again, for one glimpse of the promised land before he dies. And this seems hard to us. For Moses to have served so faithfully for so long and so close to the borders of the promised land, so close to the goal of his mission, and then to die within sight of the end without first witnessing the consummation of his life's work. Why didn't he get to enter with the rest of the people? This is explained in the book of Numbers, chapter 20. One time when they needed water, God told him to command a rock to give that water forth. But when Moses went to do it, he became so angry with the complaints of the people that he struck the rock with his staff instead and spoke as if he were the one bringing water out of the rock rather than giving glory to the Lord. And God still sent the water. But afterward he told Moses, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. And to us, this still seems like a steep penalty for one partial lapse in 40 years of faithful service. But it reminds us of the danger that attaches to speaking the word of God, to being a leader, a teacher, and the people of God. Those who teach are judged by a higher standard. And there is no mere mortal, at least no other mere mortal, who has ever taught with more authority than Moses did, who stood for so long as God's own representative to Israel and wielded his power to perform unequaled signs and wonders and great deeds of terror, as our text says. So the standard for him was that much higher. I think if Moses had not been the meekest of men, as the book of Numbers also tells us, he would have gotten into much more trouble than he did with that kind of power and influence. So Moses, the living legend, God's chosen voice and arm, stands on the mountain one last time in the presence of no one but his Lord and gazes wistfully at the green land spread out before him. And then he dies. And God buries him in the valley below in an unmarked grave. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. He was not permitted even a brief visit, even a symbolic entry into the land towards which all his efforts had been bent for 40 years. And his successor Joshua assumed command of the people, and he led them into the land of promise. And history continued without Moses. But this story has a postscript a short sequel, and we've already heard it this morning in our gospel reading. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Here we have Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the Mount of Transfiguration is in the Promised Land. So he did make it 14 centuries later. In his own day, he was forbidden to enter, but now, unexpectedly, there he is for a brief visit, a triumphal homecoming, on a mountain again, nothing unfamiliar about that, and speaking face to face with God again, Nothing unfamiliar about that. Except there is something new. God actually has a face now. It's not just a figure of speech anymore. Now he can see God as a man can be seen. He's not looking just at a cloud of radiance. Although the cloud makes an appearance too, as if to make Moses feel more at home. And he wasn't alone anymore a lone figure in converse with God. Now there was a third person in the conversation, the prophet Elijah. And there were onlookers, Peter, James, and John, who were prophets in training, apostles-to-be, who would soon be sent out into all the world 
to the descendants of Moses' people and to all the Gentiles as representatives of God with his word on their lips and empowered by him to perform signs and miracles that would vindicate their message. These men were starstruck on this occasion, gaping at Moses and Elijah, but they would later prove themselves worthy to have been part of that august gathering. Moses, the lonely man of God, suddenly has peers. And in the timelessness of glory, it was as if he had never been barred entry to Canaan. It was as if God had merely replaced the entry he had once looked forward to at the head of a fractious multitude of people for whom he bore the two monumental responsibilities of teaching them the way of the Lord, which they scarcely wanted to learn, and interceding for them with the Lord when they disobeyed in their ingratitude. It's as if God took that entry that he had looked forward to away from him and replaced it with his immeasurably greater one. And as in the old days, he talked shop with God about what needed to be done for his people Israel. Only this time they weren't talking about what he would be expected to do. No, they were talking about Jesus, what Jesus was going to do. They spoke of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That is, they spoke about his imminent death, his departure from this life, which would happen at Jerusalem just outside the city wall on the hill of the skull. After this point, the Gospel of Luke is all about going to Jerusalem and then what happens to Jesus when he arrives. And I think this must have been a welcome change to Moses, not to be the representative anymore, not to be the place where the buck stopped, the one on whom everything was resting, not to be the one against whom the people would complain every time they had a beef with God, not to be the one who was responsible to keep them in line and plead for their unworthy lives. There was a new representative in town, and his name was Jesus. There was a new prophet like Moses, but even greater than Moses, a new one who could stand as mediator between God and man. And not just between God and man, speaking to one for the other, but he also, he was God and man. God and man met in his person. He was the intermediary simply by being before he had said or done anything. He was the perfect emissary who would never strike the rock in anger, who would never fail to give his father all glory, who was both greater and meeker than Moses, who would go even to the cross quietly like a lamb led to slaughter. And there's even more here. This departure that Moses is discussing with Jesus and Elijah. In Greek, the word is exodus. They are discussing the exodus that Jesus was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And yes, an exodus is a departure. The words are synonyms. But what is Moses most known for? The exodus. The exodus of the people from Israel, of the people of Israel from Egypt that God worked through his voice and through his rod. Exodus is the Greek name of the second book of the Bible. And it was back then, too. So Moses makes an appearance on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the one thing that we're told that he does is talk to Jesus about his exodus. This can't just be a coincidence. Moses is meeting the greater Moses. The prophet who wrought the exodus from Egypt is meeting the prophet who is about to work the exodus from death and hell. The transfiguration of our Lord is the pinnacle of the epiphany season, not only because it reveals Jesus as he really was, shining in glory, but also because it reveals Moses and the prophets as they really were. People who anticipated Christ, voices that testified to Christ in advance. What God did through Moses, God is about to do again on a much grander scale through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ to lead stubborn, disobedient people like you and me out of slavery, out of bondage to sin and death, 
and make us a new nation, the people of God, with his word in our midst and his name on our brows. This Moses, Jesus Christ, goes before us into death and parts the sea so that we will not drown, so that we can follow him out of the kingdom of the devil. He goes with us in the wilderness and feeds us on his own body as manna and his own blood as water from the rock because he is the rock whom we struck in our anger and whose side gushed forth water and blood. And he is the greater Joshua. He even has the same name, Yeshua in Hebrew, who leads us triumphantly into the land of eternal promise. As we anticipate the beginning of Lent, we're preparing for time in the wilderness, or more accurately, for a time in which we will focus on the fact that we always are in the wilderness. But on the other side of Lent lies Easter, and on the other side of this life of struggle and sadness lie peace and joy in the radiant light of Jesus' face. Let us remember Moses on the mountain peak. Let us be ready willingly to die to our flesh, keeping our eyes fixed on the promise. For though we cannot yet go over there, it is sure that we will one day, if we keep the faith to the end. Our Lord will bring us to that better mountain, and we too will join in that glorious conversation. In the name of Jesus, amen.